thank you, Dr. Kumar, for uh, considering me to be part of this uh, instructor course. I've always enjoyed uh, doing this. Uh, I think you will be instructor courses. Uh, my first instructor case is a case of post operative UVX and uh, what time it took and what it took to solve this mystery. No financial disclosures. This is a story of a 44 year, year old female who came with us, came to us with a history of uh, diminution of vision uh, for distance uh, in uh, both eyes. She had floaters in the right eyes. Her main complaint was actually floaters which are underlined there. Her vision uh, was 6 by 9 and 6 in each eye. She had uh, thin posterior subcapsular cataracts in both the eyes and the fundus did show with the opacities in the right eye but otherwise was relatively normal. So because of the cataract, without giving much importance to the symptoms of floaters, uh, we did a FECO foldable, silicon foldable IOL for her in the right eye, which was supposedly uneventful. She was fine on the day two. When she came back on day nine, she did have floaters still, and she also started complaining of occasional pain in the right eye. At that time, the vision was 6 by 9 and N6, not better than what her preoperative visual acuity was. But we noted that there was a PCR. I'm sorry, I don't have a photograph of the and the segment of this patient. But this PCR was there, but was not mentioned in the operation notes. The surgeon who had operated had not mentioned that there was a PC rent during the surgery. On fundus examination, she had vitreous opacities inferiorly, which because of the pre-existing floater history that she gave before surgery was diagnosed as vitreous hemorrhage, presumably due to a PVD. So it was diagnosed as a PVD induced vitreous hemorrhage and uh, passed off as uh, vitreous hemorrhage. On subsequent follow-up, she came on uh, uh, first month, second month, thereafter she was seen again on the fourth month. Each time she was unhappy, each time she was complaining of some heaviness in the eye. Some The floaters still persist, persist there, but irritability and heaviness in the eye was something that she had com uh, continuously been complaining about. On the fifth month follow-up, she was found to have, apart from the floaters, and the heaviness in the eye, uh, intraocular pressure rise up to 52 millimeters of mercury, which was, however, controlled medically within a short time. And when she came back at the seventh month follow up, her IOP con was controlled without any medication. See, she a cataract, simple patient, a patient with a simple cataract had to keep coming to us for seven months until now, until this slide. You will see further how many more times she has come. Still, she was not happy. The floaters were still persisting and on fundus examination resolving with the opacities were there. It was no longer looking like a hemorrhage now, it was looking like retained lens fragments. So on the basis of the diagnosis of a retained lens fragment in the eye causing uveitis, so we gave her uh, posterior subpenance francilonesonide as a empirical treatment or as a stopgap treatment and she had temporary relief with that. Finally, she was seen by me on the 10th month follow-up. Till the 10th month, I had not seen this patient. She was being followed up by the juniors. And I decided that since she had had enough, we should do a vitrectomy and get rid of this uh, positive factor of the retained lens fragments. And I did, uh, I did not do this vitrectomy. It was actually done by my uh, colleague. And this was done with a wide-angle uh, lens with good visualization of the periphery. And after clearing all the uh, fragments that had dropped into the vitreous cavity, uh, we had uh, given her an IVTA also. Thereafter, she was better. So, that is the happy ending of case one. But there are question marks after that. The actual story starts now. The patient came back one month after the surgery for vitreous uh, removal of the vitreous fragments, lens fragments from the vitreous cavity, and she came back. Had, when she came back, she had a recurrence of uveitis. The vision had dropped all along when she had suffered, suffered, suffered us for nine months. She had maintained six by nine and six, but now she had a drop in vision after the vitreo. And on OCT, she had this cystic macular edema with subfocal fluid. And then we saw in detail with depression and found that this small piece of nuclear fragment was stuck to the past lena region.
there is no way to photograph this, that is why I put a schematic drawing there. And then she underwent surgery for removal of this fragment of, you know, small fragment of the nucleus which was stuck to the past lena region which was very difficult to visualize throughout those 10 months that she underwent the suffering and uh, it was also not possible to see this without depression. It was just a matter of chance that somehow we could at least see this and lo localize this at the 10th month follow-up. So we had to do a bimanual surgery for her because the surgeon had to depress in order to gain access to this, to this fragment. Sorry about the video. And uh, because this was close to the ora serata, the fluid air exchange with cryotherapy to the peripheral retina was done and uh, finally her OCT came back to normal for, for, for Covid contour and the vision was restored to 6 by 6 and 6 and this is when I can say that it was indeed a happy ending. But what were the lessons from the case that we learned? We have to respect and address the complaints of the patient. The patient came to us with floaters whereas because we saw the cataract we jumped into doing the cataract surgery. This is something which we have to remember. Even if the patient has cataract, whatever the patient complains of, I think we should address that first. If we have a complication, this, the antisigmoid surgeon who did the surgery should not conceal a complication just because he feels that it has passed off uh, without any uh, event. That it, although there was a PCR, probably he felt that it was okay to just pass it off as uh, uncomplicated or uneventful, which is wrong. So, we should practice a knowledge documentation. In fact, whenever there is a PCR, we should actually document what actually happened along the PCR. We should make a note of how much vitreous was lost, how much of nuclear fragments went back, what was whether the epinucleus went back or not. And this has to be passed on, this information has to be passed on to the veterinary surgeon for him to be able to, uh, you know, actually uh, expect and anticipate what to do. And a depressed peripheral examination, I think, is a must in all cases of UBA, post of UBA, is, you might be dealing with uh, uh, nuclear fragment retained in the past in a region, as in this case. So in all cases of post-operative uveitis, maintain a high index of suspicion for nuclear fragments. This is the message that I want to give across to you. My case too is uh, about an 8-year-old boy cross-referred with dilated pupils. He came with a history of sudden decrease in vision in the left eye of 8 days duration. He had occasional pain and redness uh, lasting 2 months and his vision was 6 by 24 partial in the affected eye. Slit lamp examination showed AC cells 3 plus. The fundus picture at presentation was not very clear to take a photograph of it. So we, I, this is a schematic drawing. This is the left eye actually should have been on that side. Uh, you can see that there was the uh, fibrous band passing superiorly from the optic disc about, for about two disc diameters superiorly. There was vitreous hemorrhage and through the vitreous hemorrhage we could see that the peripheral vessels showed exudative sheathing. Or nothing. Retrospective history, nothing forthcoming. There is no history of trauma. So this patient was diagnosed as having vasculitis. Empirically started on old steroids and topical steroids and sent for investigations, uh, the usual uh, vasculitic workup that we do for this age group of patients we sent him for. At one week of follow-up, after the starting of steroids, this patient had a mild clearing of vitreous hemorrhage. The disc, the fibrosis that was uh, extending from the disc superiorly was better seen now and peripheral vascular sheathing also was better seen and the vision was still, as still low at 624 part. So we decided to treat him empirically with, uh, since the investigations had come normal, we, we thought that we should treat him with a, a row of anterior cryotherapy for the vasculitis and the vitreous hemorrhage that had ensued following the vasculitis. We treated with ARC. One week post ARC of the inferior or periphery, the vision was restored by one line. There was a clearing of vitreous hemorrhage and at six weeks the vision came back to six by nine with good clearing of the vitreous hemorrhage. That means there was a vasculitis which was a causative factor for the vitreous hemorrhage and with the cryotherapy there was a resolution. So, at that time we saw that there was a floating foreign body seen in the inferior retina. There were the peripheral cryomarks which we had used and we decided that this could be probably be a case 
of an written in the form body, although it was also in our mind that this could have been a nematode. So this is a case of an intraocular foreign body masquerading as retinal vasculitis. So with this in mind, we thought now that we know the cause, we should go in and remove this foreign body. So surgery was undertaken seven weeks after presentation. Intraoperatively, what we saw was that this site of entry was missed all along the first six weeks and this track of cataract or the track of the foreign body in the lens had been missed. The entry wound and the localized cataract had not been noticed by us. Because the patient came with dilated pupils, I will tell you why we missed this. And this is the, this is the surgery which we did for removal of the foreign body. The small piece of foreign body, about three, uh, one point, uh, say two to three millimeters in size, uh, it was not measured accurately, but then that is the foreign body which could have, which, which came easily with the 23 gauge cannula itself with the forceps. So, retrospective history, boy would play regularly at a functional car garage. He was from a rural background and there was a tractor and a car uh, mechanic next door and that is where he used to go and play. It was an open area where boys used to go and play and that is where he probably sustained the injury. At four weeks follow-up, his vision was 6 by 6 and the fundus was stable like this picture you see here. But this is where the site of foreign body ricocheting was. When we saw the fibrous tissue on day one, we did not wonder why this was there. There was this vasculitis, there was a vitreous hemorrhage, there was uveitis, but we did bother to find out or did not worry much about this fibrous tissue band which is so common in intractor foreign bodies which usually develops between the site of ricocheting or site of impact of the foreign body and the disc. So what is instructive about this case? We should include a social history, a proper history where he goes to play, even why, who, you see, uh, uh, a bystander of uh, on the road or anywhere where work is going on. We have had uh, cases where people have sustained injury while watching the road uh, metalling, that is asphalting on the road, where they sometimes hit the stone. So such being the case, we should, I think, include a detailed history. Maintain a low threshold for EUA in children. See, what has happened is, this, this boy has come to us. Uh, we have not... Uh, he has come from another department, from the IT segment department with dilated pupils. So we thought we should look only into the fundus. So a detailed examination is mandatory. Even if it's a boy, if he is not cooperative, you should probably schedule him and try to see the rest of the uh, findings, try to elicit all the findings that are possible to get uh, in these children. Even during the cryotherapy that we did, which was under anesthesia, the IT segment findings were missed. We just went in, saw, because we were biased that this was a vasculitis, we thought we should do the cryo. We didn't bother to see the anti-segment. It's actually a confession. This is probably a side effect of super specialization. So don't, we should see the eye as a whole, the patient as a whole, and treat accordingly. So with this, I think, in any unexplained uveitis, we should consider foreign body as well. Thank you very much.